Alright, things are working I guess. <clears throat> hello, hello, hello. Tuesday evening, Tasting Tuesdays. Uh, welcome. It's a great time to sniffy sniff, swirl swirl, drinky drink. Uh, let's give it a, a minute or two and uh, welcome everybody to a, uh, a bit of a tasting session. I'm excited. We have the Trevilian White Wine 2019. I hope it's in your glass. Uh, we're talking about Hi, Jenna Morrison. Good evening. First one of the evening. 2019 Trevilian White. Um, slightly chilled. Only been open for a couple of minutes. I'm excited. I have a glass full of it. Excited to share it with you and talk with you. So uh, Donna Goff, good evening. Looking forward to the Trevilian White, as am I. It's been, um, I haven't tried it since bottling, so I'm super, super excited to see how it is. Lynn Pantos, good evening to you. Evening, evening, evening. Uh, let's give it a minute just to allow people to jump on. Susan Glenn, hey uh, from Susan and Dave. Good evening from Kath and Aria and Stephen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. There's Maureen Hamilton Scott. I do so miss you on Sundays, partly uh, because you bring those wonderful Gerhardt's chocolates. Good to see you, Maureen. I hope you're doing well. Love to you and the family. Uh, let's see who else is there. Um, Kelly Goff is there. Terry Heiser. Hi, wine peeps. Uh, Terry Hauser. It's good to see you. Beth Smith. Hello to you and your family. Sylvia Miller. Trish Seinwell. It was great to see you the other day. So lovely to see you. Andrea Peters. Hey from the Peters. It's uh, lovely to see you. Lindsay Medlin. Kevin Norfleet up in Philadelphia. P.A. Tracy France and to uh, you and Paul in, uh, I believe you're in Florida. Let me see, Davenport, Florida, absolutely. Uh, Kelly says you're drinking the 2017 version tonight. Phenomenal wine, very different to what we're drinking tonight, but um, fantastic, I'm glad you have it. Let's see who else is here. Marlene Reddor, good evening. Sam Seelig, hello Sam and Ray. It's good to see you guys, hope you're doing well. Love to you and our godson Thrasher. Hope, uh, hope you and your family are doing well. We, we miss you guys. Hope we can see you soon. Valerie, hey Ma, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining as you do every week. Susan Crandall, um, Dennis and Marsha Sugamelli with uh, Mathis's. Uh, lovely to see you. I was wondering where you were. And then there's Kathy Harden. Um, let's see, James Belitho from Williamsburg. Thank you for joining us. God, Laura Purdy, Lynn Schaffenmeyer, OH. Beverly Lawson from RVA. My word, we have a, um, gosh, we have so many wonderful people on board. So it is 7.03, so how about we just jump into it and we drink what I think is a, a phenomenal little wine that maybe doesn't get as much sort of uh, press and kudos um, than, than some of the others. But it's our Trevilian, Linda Irvin, good evening to you, my dear. It's so lovely to, to see you. But um, as always, let's start off with first, you know, happy Father's Day to all your dads, you know, um, you know, to the rays uh, of this world. Thank you to your dads for, for such a great job. Listen, we know moms rock, but give us one day where, where dads can feel like we do something. So happy Father's Day. And if uh, my mom and dad are watching in South Africa, I doubt it. But Pops, appreciate you. Thank you so much to, to Robbie and to Al as well, um, you know, it's it's such a pleasure to, to have known you and appreciate everything you've done. So I hope you've had a great weekend. I hope you're having a, a great, great Tuesday. And here we are just to speak for 45 minutes to an hour about about wine, to, to have some fun, to, to learn about something, to, to talk about what we're doing, to introduce a, a really phenomenal wine to you and to answer some of your questions. So I have my, my, my favorite assistant in the whole wide world, the most amazing, the most gorgeous, Kathy, and uh, she's going to sort of pass on all your questions. If you have them, we'll try and answer everything as possible. If we don't get to them tonight, we will get to them tomorrow morning. It's really important that we ask everything, um, we, we answer everything that you ask. So good evening to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Let's jump into it. So Trevilian White. Um, the first question would be, what is in the name? Um, and that's a great question. So Terry, let's answer that straight off the uh, off the bat. The the name came from a, a competition we we kind of threw out there a couple of years ago, and and Hilda Lee came up with the, the name Trevilian. Trevilian Station is is just around the road from us, and the Battle of Trevilian 
um, was a, a battle fought through the, the Civil War. It was actually June 11th and June 12th in 1864 in Union. And basically, uh, Lieutenant Ulysses Grant's uh, overland campaign against the Confederate Robert Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. And it was a, a cavalry battle led by Major General Philip Sheridan, fought against the, the Confederate cavalry under Major General Wade Hampton and Pittsburgh Lee. And it was actually the bloodiest largest all cavalry battle in the war now the name was intended to be uh for a red wine because obviously you know many many lives were lost i i think the numbers were some 800 odd in the the confederate army and and a thousand members of the union army but the the objective of the raid was to destroy stretches of the Virginia uh, the Virginia Central Railways um, Railroad rather, and it provided a, a diversion that would occupy the Confederate cavalry from understanding Grant's planned crossing of the James River. Um, so when we when we thought of it, obviously you know we're on a, a pretty historical site. We've dug up a lot of artifacts from the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. So the name Trevelyan is in reference to to that battle. Who won it? Um, there's both sides of the equation. Um, as a diversion tactic, uh, Sheridan wrote in I think it was 1866 that he he was successful. Historians believe that the, the Confederates were, were successful just for the, the pure losses, but it was actually a, a pretty bloody cavalry battle, and the name was actually a play on the, the red blend that we've, we've been doing, but subsequently we've, um, we've created a white blend. So Trevelyan is a blend, first and foremost, and it's a blend of Viognier, 72% of the wine is uh, Viognier, 28% is Vidal Blanc. So we couldn't call it Viognier. For, for the wine to be a Viognier in Virginia, 75% of the wine has to be of that varietal. So 72% Viognier, 28% Vidal Blanc. Um, we've spoken about Viognier. We've spoken about the grape and how it came from Dalmatia, which is present day Croatia, brought to France from the Romans, um, and where it's, it's probably most famous in the Northern Rhone in Condrieu. Uh, and in the 60s, Viognier was almost extinct. I think there was something like 60 hectares in the world planted. Now, a hectare is 2.6 acres. So that's about, a, what, 130-odd acres of, of grapes. Subsequent plantings have, have arisen, obviously, in Virginia, but in California and South Africa and Australia. Um, and many believe this grape to be Virginia's sort of signature, its calling card, the, the wine that would put Virginia on the map. And I'm excited to say that that maybe it has, but also there's so many other varietals that Virginia does incredibly well. But Viognier obviously holds a special part um, in in our in our history. It's the largest single planted varietal on the estate. If you don't know, 16 acres of Viognier is planted on the estate. Now Vidal, Vidal is a cross um, between Ugni Blanc, also known as Trebbiano, and um, what am I I'm missing? It's another uh, kind of blend as well, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, it's it's sort of an obscure grape a little bit. It's it's probably most famously used in, in ice wine production in Canada. It makes really, really sort of wonderful, wonderful sweet wines. Um, so let's talk about viticultural, how we make the wine, and then, you know, kind of obviously jump into and taste in it, and then, um, you know, talk about and answer some of the questions. So let me, let me see if I can pull up, uh, if I may, there's an aerial view. Let me pull to the side. So we are talking of the block to the left of the house that runs sort of from the the southeast to the northwest. And that is our nine acre block of Viognier that has Vidal Blanc interplanted with it. Now the topography of the of the vineyard is really important, which would also explain why we put Vidal Blanc in the vineyard. So the one thing about Keswick that we have is incredible soil, you know, really well-drained soils. And we talk a lot about how mitigating and managing water, the effects of rain, because we get 40 to 45 inches a year is really important. But if you look at that, that map to the left, which is where this fruit is grown and comes from, it runs, you know, the, the point, that sort of point to that arrow of the vineyard that is the highest point of the vineyard, and it goes very much to, to the lowest point, which is in the back end. And that block behind the tree line, that is our seven acre, known as our block seven. And that runs from the highest point on the right to the lowest point on the left. 
So Viognier being an early budding varietal is very susceptible to frost. If you don't know what frost is, you just need to be a grape grower in 2020 and you found out eight times. So Vidal, why, why it's important is Vidal has a lot of similar sort of flavor characteristics. It ripens at roughly the same time, but if it gets frosted, it does tend to produce a secondary shoot that is fruitful. Um, so we felt that with that block, we could put a little bit of Vidal in there. Um, and if we do get frosted, we're still going to get a certain amount of fruit that comes out of that block, right? So what we are talking about is not a blend that we make in the cellar. This is a field blend. The fruit is actually harvested simultaneously that when we harvest the Viognier and remember last year or last week, we had a, um, we had a, a live video of the machine harvesting. We're actually adding the Vidal Blanc and the Viognier at the same time. Now, when we sampling, we sample the Viognier, we sample the Vidal, we look where they are, and then we add them together in an approximate sort of percentage of what they are. Um, and we are assuming, and based on numbers and, and cluster weights and vines, we're, we're sort of guesstimating pretty accurately that 28% of the, of the blend is, um, is Vidal Blanc, right? So it's field harvested now. Let me see, back to the scene, there we go. Um, so it's machine harvested, and, and let me see if I, if I can. Uh, the, the harvester, there we go. Um, this is the harvester that we're talking about. It's a, a drag behind, so it basically um, shows you how we're doing it. It straddles the vines. It has a, a series of ribs or bows, and they move like this. They shake the fruit, and the fruit gets collected into the machine, and it gets dispersed uh, equally to, to the left and the right bins. So the fruit is picked really early in the morning. That's important because of the temperature. So Virginia at around September, October, when we're harvesting this fruit, it can get really, really warm and it can get warm really, really quickly. So we want to get in as early as possible in the morning to get the fruit when it's really, really cold. Um, because once you, you get that grape off, the, off the, the vine and it goes into that harvester, you know, it's exposed to oxygen, you know, it's exposed to warm temperatures and things are going to grow. Um, so then we, we transfer it to the, the winery. Um, we, we stick it into the, the press and let me see if I can get that. Um, there's the, the fruit going into to the press. Um, you know, the press is, is actually very, very gentle. It's a bladder press. So the, the fruit is held in there and it has a bag, which we call the bladder, obviously, that runs length to length, hooked up to an air compressor and that bag expands as we fill it with air. And as the, the bag touches the grapes, you know, juice is extracted. We always talk about what free run and press fractions are. To be honest, free run is the juice that comes out of the press with just the weight of the, the fruit. So when you're putting five tons, uh, we can put five tons of whole clusters in there. We can actually put seven, seven and a half tons of destemmed fruit in there as well. Um, so the, the free run juice is what comes out of the press with just the weight of the fruit. The light press, the medium press, and the heavy press is really much the, the, the pressure of the bag. So light pressing is sort of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 bar, medium 0 0.6 to about 1, 1, 1, 2. And then longer than that, then we get into sort of heavy press fractions. Now there is a sensorial quality between free run and, and heavy press. And, and we think there is a qualitative difference between what comes out of the press early versus what comes out of the press later. Right, so there's a, a color difference, there's a sugar difference, but you're also seeing a, a change in pH because the, the contact of the skins, you're getting a lot of potassium in the juice, the pH starts rising. And then at some point, sensorially, you're looking at the numbers. You know, make no mistake, we're looking at the chemistry and we're looking at the sugars and the acid in, in the form of titratable acidity and the pH. But at some point, the juice just, it, it becomes uninspiring. You know, it loses character. And at the end of the day, remember, philosophically, not only do we want to reflect in the glass how the grape was grown, but we want to make wines with character. We want to make wines that make you feel something, right? We never want you to make a wine you go, yeah, it's a white, it's okay, it's fine, you know, uninspiring. So we, we've worked really, really hard to not only harvest fruit at, at the correct sort of parameters that will allow us to make the kind of wines that we want, but we also, when we process the fruit very, very sort of gently, you know, we're tasting and tasting and tasting. And we want to make sure that at some point we sort of cut off those press fractions. 
in in the 17 vintage we used all the heavy press fractions from all the multiple lots from the year in 2019 we really thought we could ramp up the quality by pressing a little bit more gently um, and a little bit more sort of carefully so let me let me see um, yeah oh there we go hang on um, so there's the juice um, this is what happens this is what your Trevelyan looks like when it comes out of the press it's dirty it looks yucky it's like brown water but it tastes phenomenal really really sweet it's got a lot of acid it's got a lot of vibrancy we then run that juice into a tank this wine is naturally settled and what I mean by that is the juice is cloudy uh, there's a lot of solids in there um, but will settle in a vessel given some time now a lot of winemakers choose to use different sort of processes there's flotation where they uh, where they bubble sort of nitrogen or some gas into the wine and all those solids float to the top you could add an enzyme and what's an enzyme an enzyme is just a catalyst it speeds up a reaction it breaks down it's a pectolytic enzyme it breaks down the solids it settles to the bottom of the tank we've decided to to really add a little bit of sulfur a lot of the questions are do you add sulfur we do not a lot um, and then you know we allow the the juice to to naturally to settle and when we when we're talking about sort of how turbid or how clean we're looking at something called NTUs or Nifol turbidity units as well so let me go back to um, the the scene there we go I'm right back then that juice once we've reached a certain clarity gets run off into tank the big difference between the 17 and the 19 is that the the 19 is 100% tank fermented and tank matured which is really really important and um, I think it sort of shows a little bit of the the way we're moving in terms of our whites uh, we're looking for white and bright that that sums it up in a nutshell right bright meaning acidity it's vibrant it's got tension it has that sort of minerality to it as well um, minerality is I would say non herbaceous non fruit it's almost like wet rocks it's like walking on the beach and that sort of wind comes off the ocean and it sprays you it's sort of uh, sidewalk chalk you know it's it's rain after after it's rain and you go out and it has that dampness that is what minerality is to me and we're trying to conserve acidity and the reason we try and do that is because Viognier historically is a low acid grape um, and if it's low acid it's just gonna be oily it's gonna be fat it's gonna be flabby and some people love that weight and that texture but the other thing is if you're gonna drink a wine in the spring and the summer in temperatures and days like today I think you want wines that are vibrant and fresh and just you know piercingly laser like acidity again you know I'm not saying that's that's what you should drink it's just uh, what we try and present in a in a glass so um, that is that is essentially the the methodology again we're talking about a vintage 2019 that was phenomenal and again what is a phenomenal vintage it can be described in many 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 ways it could be sugar it could be the health of the fruits it could be tonnage for me a phenomenal vintage is when the vineyard and the grapes you know can be picked on your terms when you want to pick them you're not rushed to pick them you know you've got good clean fruit but you're picking the the fruits in a way and at a time which allows you then to go back to the winery and then make the kind of wine that you you want to make I don't know if that explains it but that's that's pretty much it so um, you know that that's sort of the explanation about the wine but let's um, let's get into the wine the the first thing you'd notice for, um, is that it's a screw cap don't don't be scared about a screw cap a screw cap is a wonderful way to, to kind of seal a wine especially for a wine that is supposed to be sort of drunk early it's vibrant will it last two or three years I know a lot of people say how long could you keep this wine you know this is a, a two to four three to five year wine I think the Vidal and the Viognier they can age longer than that you're sort of you're sort of rolling the dice a little bit would it improve the wine maybe somewhat is it going to improve uh, exponentially like a red wine would absolutely not the wine is made for enjoyment at an early stage so pour yourself a glass um, again you know the the shape and the style of the glass is really important I, I always think that you know the wine is drink what you like how you like when you like but if you have a half decent wine stick it in a half decent glass I think there is value to, to putting a wine in a in a glass that um, is is somewhat decent so let me hold it up I'll, I'll kind of use me as the background 
It, it is not a golden yellow color. It's not a sun-kissed color. The wine is made reductively. And what I mean by that is we, we try and uh, minimize the exposure of the juice and the wine to oxygen as opposed to something like Chardonnay, perhaps. You might hyper-oxidize or you might um, oxidize it heavily. The other sort of the, the, the key thing is that this doesn't see any time in a barrel. So there's no sort of oxidation through the porosity of the oak. You know, you're not having that evaporative effect and we're not stirring the barrels and opening up the barrels that much. This is purely tank to tank to tank. And when we move wine from the settling to the juice to the fermentation phase, we're doing it under an inert gas. So carbon dioxide, nitrogen, argon, anything heavy, heavier than air, it basically um, protects the juice. So beautiful, beautiful color, kind of light a little bit more on the, um, on the straw color the, than, um, than anything else. But more importantly, yeah, it's great to look at. It's beautiful to look at, but no one ever said that's a beautiful looking wine and I'm gonna buy it. Let's sort of delve into it. And again, you know, when you, when you think of wine, don't, don't just throw it down your gullet. You know, maybe there's some times when you need to. But, uh, you know, what I love about wine is sort of the aromatic intensity and how that sort of builds up a crescendo, crescendo to, to what you're expecting. So, again, you know, uh, we're going to give it a sniffy sniff. So there you are, Mr. Lanny White, where, again, give it a, a good old swirl. And what you're doing is you're volatilizing esters. And esters, again, are the aromatic compounds formed by the reaction between alcohols and carboxylic acids. Um, get your nose deep in there, close your eyes and give it a really, really, really good sniff. Uh, let's see what we get. So dominantly Viognier, you're already thinking, um, you know, we're thinking yellow fruits. You know, again, you're thinking sort of tropical mango, papaya, apricot, pineapple, uh, floral, you're getting those sort of terpenoids or terpene kind of characters in the in the wine, and I think that is really abundant. There's a lot of sort of floral tones in there as well, um, but it's it's beautifully expressive. It's it's so so aromatically intense. You find some wines are aromatically neutral. You almost have to go, what is it that I'm smelling? And then you know what winemakers do they use things to sort of bring flavors to the to the fore could be oak it could be yeast the the great thing about viognier is that it's so expressive not only in the juice phase um we really want to conserve and amplify that that viognier so i think you would guess that this is mainly viognier if not dominantly just by the the nose it's got this beautiful like i said floral fresh clean cut flowers uh yellow fruits on the back end as well now it is a young wine. We only bottled this, um, what are we now? We're in June, so we bottled this uh, May 29th. It's, it's been in the bottle less than, a, less than a month. So beautiful sort of aromas. It's enticing you. It's saying, I need to be drunk. I want to expect to be drunk. So cheers, guys and girls. Hope you're doing all right. Um, put it in your mouth. Swirl it around the mouth. See where the wine sits. Is it in the front with acid? Does it have a bit of sweetness up front? Will it be in the back? And you know, that's sort of tannins because tannins by definition precipitate and bind with proteins in your saliva. You shouldn't get it in the back because there are no tannins in these wines. Very little skin contact and no oak whatsoever. So Yeah, so a lot of people are serving temperature. I think there's a difference between drinking and thinking wines, right? So for this purpose, you know, the wine is probably served a little warmer than most people would enjoy it. If I was sitting on the deck, perhaps uh, a few degrees cooler would be would be something that would provide more enjoyment. But in terms of sort of a, a thinking wine, I like to serve wines, you know, almost at room temperature, maybe a, a, a touch sort of um, kind of warmer than that or cooler than that rather. But you know, what I, I love is that firstly, you, you get that really bright acidity. Um, and again, we're talking about malic acid, which along with tartaric acid are the two dominant acids in wine. And what we do is we want to conserve that natural acidity. So we actually inhibit the onset of secondary fermentation. Now, secondary fermentation, for those that might not know, is if we add something, uh, a lactic acid bacteria, and it's a decarboxylation of malic acid to lactic acid. What that means is that the natural acid of malic, which is a green apple acid, because it comes from the Latin word malum, 
you know, think of a Granny Smith, tart, clear, bright, turns into lactic acid, which is a milk acid, softer, rounder, richer, more voluptuous. Now, the one thing about Virginia, uh, we don't tend to have a lot of natural acidity in our juice, partly because of our climate. You know, if you had elevation and you're at 900, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 feet, you're probably going to have more acid in the juice than we will because of that elevation and the cooler nighttime temperatures. Our daytime and evening temperatures, you know, our evening temperatures can be in the 60s, 65. So Viognier, especially if you're trying to harvest it at sort of physiological ripeness and flavor development, you're harvesting it at, at 23, 23 and a half, 24 bricks. But what you are sacrificing is acidity. Um, so we want to conserve that acid. So do we add acid to the juice? Yes, we do. And that's just in the in the name of transparency. We add acid. We want to get the acid up. We want to bring that pH down. It also means that we can add less sulfur in the bottle. It makes these wines drinkable a lot earlier versus having to lay them down for three, six months to a year. Um, but you get that really wonderful core of acidity. It's very bright. A lot of stone fruit character. Uh, I'm getting a lot of sort of apple, uh, a little bit of sort of citrus tones in there as well. But what I really like about this wine is its texture. And I think that comes from the Vidal. You know, it's got weight and it's got length and it has this really lovely viscosity, but it's not flabby. You know, flabby again is a wine that, that has that richness and that oiliness um, but doesn't have the acidity to, to sort of boot. So I think it has that acidity, which really cuts through sort of the inherent sweetness and the, the texture of the wine. Um, and then, you know, again, you get that really beautiful core of yellow fruit. Um, again, I think more sort of honeysuckle and cantaloupe. Let me try again here. Yeah, a little bit interesting. Very different to what I, um, I initially said. I've got my, my tech notes in front of me, and um, I said the flavors are typical tropical in nature, but there's a touch of spiciness in the back. I don't get the I don't get the spiciness this evening. I don't know if you do or not, but you know sometimes we get a lot of baking spices, which are the the sort of the nutmegs and the cloves and the cinnamons. I, I don't really get that right now, and. Is that perhaps because the wine is a little bit tight? Has it gone through bottle shock? I think there was a comment from uh, Dennis Sugamelli about bottle shock. Um, I don't think it's heavily shocked because the, the aromas are actually quite accentuated and amplified, but I think the flavor profile is a little bit tight. And based on what I wrote uh, prior to bottling, you know, the, the palate is a, a little bit different. So perhaps a bit tight, but let's um, let the wine aerate a little bit. And, and see if it opens up. One thing that, that um, our wines do is they really sort of open up with warmth and with aeration. Um, this wine was, was open probably about 10 minutes before we started, so it's been open for about 40 minutes. A, a good hour or two, perhaps decanting the wine is a, is a great idea if you're gonna drink this wine young. Um, but yeah, I, I love it. Aging potential, we always talk about that. Uh, again, you know, in that sort of two to three, three to four years would be great if the wine is is kept in optimal cellar conditions. And again, what I mean by that is keep it in an area where the temperature is at least consistent and the high 50s, lower 60s is fine. Keep it away from sunlight. I think this wine will, will develop um, quite lovely and, and quite well over the next couple of years. Would you, would you, is there any benefit to aging it longer than that? I don't know and I, I would suggest probably not. I think the enjoyment in is how, how sort of bright and flavorful this wine is. Will it develop some complexity? Probably. Will it develop a little bit of sort of weight? Um, you know, will it change much and will additional age help it some? Of course. Would it, would it mean aging this wine for three years before you drink it? Uh, probably not. Probably not. I think, it's, I think it's wonderful to drink right now. In terms of food, uh, a lot of people ask about food pairings. I think with, with lobster, monkfish that has a slightly sort of oily character. I think it would stand up to dishes with sort of cream dishes, Alfredo sauce and spices. Um, but I think I, I love sort of the fresh sort of seafood play on this wine. I think the, 
the fresh seafood oysters on the half shell, shrimp, ceviche, uh, diver scallop, something like that would really, really go uh, really, really well. Sort of cod and monkfish uh, would, would go well as well. Um, it could also go with sort of spicy dishes like uh, Indian curries or Thai foods or green chilies. I think it's got sort of sweetness in the wine, not residual sugar. There was a question I saw about residual sugar. Let me be 100% uh, correct here. The, the residual sugar, the RS, is one gram per liter. So that's 0.1% of the total wine. So it is, it is minimal. There's nothing, nothing in there as well. So it's a beautiful wine. It's, um, it's a wine that we, we don't do every single year. I think it's a wine we should do every year. Um, I, I love how Vidal just gives it, the Viognier, some, some weight and some backbone. But it doesn't really sort of sacrifice the aromatic intensity and the beauty that is Viognier. It's what I love, love uh, about Viognier is that it's so expressive and so intoxicating aromatically that it just makes you want to drink it. And I think that's what wine does in such a great manner is that it sets you up for your drinking experience. So that's it. 31 minutes to talk about a bottle of wine. So I have my, my wonderful wife next to me. Uh, I just uh, I saw Mark Kutsia get on. Uh, Mark, buddy, in the BVI, it's it's good to see you. I hope you and Carrie um, and the, the little ones are doing all right. It's always good. Thank you, buddy, for, for kind of jumping on. And love to all you guys. Hope we, we catch up in the in the very new future. So, my dear, lovely, lovely wife, are there any questions that we should kind of chat about? Yeah, so Janice Bryant is drinking a bottle that does not have a year on it. And she wanted to know what, who you were. When is that one from? Or non-vintage blend? Is the non-vintage Trevelyan Y? I think it was the first one we did. Um, it was a blend of multiple years back. I, you know, if it was non-vintage, more than likely it's a blend of multiple vintages. You can add up to, uh, I believe it's 5 or 10% of, a, of another vintage into the wine. Um, I don't offhand remember, so I'm not even going to take a chance, but Janice... If it's a non-vintage, it's a blend of varietals made in, in various years that exceeds the allowable percentage of, of what we can blend in. Um, but I hope you're enjoying it, but I apologize. My, my memory is a little bit sort of vague on that wine as well. But why don't you tell me how it is and uh, what you think of it? I'd, I'd love to know. So um, I apologize. I don't know more about that, but I will get on tomorrow. I will find the tech notes for that wine and I will be sure to, to let you know the blend and and why it was labeled as a non-vintage wine but uh thanks for joining us and thank you for the question and then uh, marcia and tracy france both asked if you use different percentages each year if it's the same um the How question from the 2017 was actually five varietals. marcia yeah so the the blend changes each and every year um the varietals are different too so the 2017 had two lots of chardonnay two lots of viognier Vidal, Verdejo, and Traminette. Um, so it was actually a blend of seven different varietals. And as I mentioned earlier on, it was all the varietals that we used. And what we did in the press, we, we kind of collected all the, the heavy press fractions, kept them in a tank, blended them together, blended them together, find them. Um, because what we did, we wanted to remove some of the bitterness out of the wine. Because when you press grapes really heavily, you get a lot of the, sort of the skin contact um, and you get to sort of that pithiness and the bitterness. So we use something called PVP fee, which is polyvinyl polypyrrolidone, and um, we find the wines, and then we fermented what was the Trevilian, but as a as a blend. And I believe it was something like um, what was it, thirty Viognier, thirty Chardonnay, twenty ten and ten of the Verdeo, Vidal, and the Traminette. Um, it was also barrel fermented and matured in French oak in five hundred liter punchin barrels. So what you're going to get with the 17s, you're going to get a lot more sort of doughy, yeasty bread sort of characteristics, caramel, butterscotch, a little bit of vanilla. And I think comparatively side by side, this is going to be a little bit lighter, but it's going to be brighter, more acidic, and maybe a better summertime wine where the 17, I really felt it was a beautiful wine to have in sort of the fall and the winter. Um, you know, I love drinking the wine on its own, but perhaps... It was better sort of suited with with food where i think you know these 19 vintage wines the trevilian whites these are wines that first and foremost you can drink on their own 
you know, we want to make sure that you, you don't have to go and buy lobster or something to make the wine drinkable. We want to make sure that if you just want a freaking glass of wine at the end of the day, you can open up our wine, kind of crush that cap and drink a wine that's going to provide ample in enjoyment. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for that question. But the Trevelyan does change year and year. It gives us flexibility based on, number one, the quality of the vintage, the quality of the fruit. It allows us to find a home for the heavy sort of press fractions. But, um, you know, the other question is, when we label something a varietal versus a, um, a generic name, it's not that the generic label that we give it is an in indication of a poorer quality. Just because it's Trevelyan White versus Chardonnay or Viognier, um, I still think it's a phenomenal wine. And it really, really does require you know more work and more intense work on our parts. And in the 19, I think it was a, a really lovely step up in quality Obviously, stylistically as well, I think, you know, we're talking about making wines that are drinkable, vibrant, enjoyable, and slightly more acidic than, than years gone by. Um, I've got someone I want to say hi quickly, so pop on in here, and uh, everyone says, what's the best thing you've ever made? <laughs> Mwah! That's the best thing I've ever made. So, Aria, say hi to everybody. Hi. All right, love you. Cool. Um, any other questions? So, all righty. Uh, yeah, um, Tracy asked, is there any of the 2017 left? Yeah, Tracy, thank you for the, for the question. Do we have any of the 2017 left? We have seven cases left. Um, we had a, a meeting today. We were talking about when to release the 2019. So we have seven cases, 84 bottles of the wonderful 2017. So if you love the 17, pick up a few bottles. Um, buy a few bottles of the 19 drink the 17 while the 19 ages and I think you can't go I think you can't go wrong. So um, Yeah, there we go And um, Sharon asked what do you do if the DNA and Badal Blanc ripen at different times? Um, that is a great question uh, and that came from Sharon so uh, From Sharon what do you do if the Viognier and the Vidal ripen at different times? Um, so the first thing is you, you wouldn't want to go in with a, with a machine and just run over everything. So the good thing is they are incredibly distinctive. You will not um, take a Vidal vine and think it's a Viognier and vice versa. So what we would do at that point, we would test the Vidal, test the Viognier. We would put the grapes together and test that juice. The other thing though, I would add though, if the Vidal is slightly underripe and the Viognier is ripe, that might not be such a bad thing because the Vidal might not have the flavor development and the sugars, but being an underripe grape, what it is going to have is acidity. So quite honestly, we might harvest the Vidal slightly underripe, which means you get the flavor development from the Viognier, you get the really aromatic sort of components from that, but then you get a slightly um, maybe underripe sort of pithiness, but you get the acidity, which is really important. Because remember, Viognier is sometimes, you know, criticized for being this really opulent, rich, decadent, flabby wine. Um, and it lacks acidity. So one thing is that it might not be a bad thing, but the other thing is we can go in and pick the, the different lots by hand. Um, you know, pick the Viognier, leave the Vidal on the vine, if the weather allows us to do so go back uh, a couple of days, a week, a week or two later, and uh, and go from there. So uh, it's a great question, but it gives you flexibility in, in styles. Um, but, you know, partly the reason we added some Vidal to the vine, and honestly, we might add different varietals to that block to build up complexity. And, you know, we, we could plant something like Petit Mansang, which has got a lot of sugar and acidity, pick pool other own varietals. But I love the, the flexibility Vidal gives you having planted in. And then obviously there's a very sound, practical reason for putting Vidal in the vineyard because that vineyard is a, a wonderful vineyard. We lovingly refer to the bastard block because it is a pain in the ass to work, but boy, doesn't it produce intense fruit with character and vibrancy. And again, we always talk about wines that make you think and feel something. You know, we never want you to get a wine that you go, eh, it's okay and it's uninspiring. I think this block really produces fruit that is is inspiring and is at least intellectually challenging. Um, and I think this wine is a, a reflection of how we're dialing back 
maybe the uh, the opulence of Viennia and making wines are a bit more fresh and a little bit more vibrant wines that you can drink. But phenomenal question. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that a lot. So I'm running out of wine. So they always say conversation without wine is just called gossiping. So uh, let me pour while we get the next question. Uh, Sam Seelig asked, is there one you can compare this to? A wine that's from outside of Virginia that you can get to this time. Oh, dear Sam. Uh, love you guys and the Sea Legs. Uh, amazing people. We miss you. Look forward to hanging out with you. Um, the question is, is there a, a wine comparable to this that comes from a, a, a different region? Um, I think if you look at our 17, you know, with the oak, I would say it's uh, comparable maybe to a, a Chenin Blanc or an aged Chenin Blanc, maybe not Vouvray, but perhaps a, a South African Chenin Blanc. Um, this one, you know, um, maybe Alsatian Pinot Gris. You know, I, I wouldn't say Gewürztraminer because it doesn't have the spice. Solving a Blanc certainly doesn't work. Uh, perhaps like a Chablis. A Chardonnay because it has some of that sort of stony minerally kind of characteristics without oak which Chablis is a an, um, an appellation in the northern most part of Burgundy uh, it, they make really sort of beautifully vibrant sort of wines probably doesn't have the aromatic intensity but perhaps Chablis um, but yeah perhaps sort of Alsatian Pinot Gris might be in my mind the the best one the other one I, I might do is maybe Semillon uh, and Semillon is historically blended with Sauvignon Blanc and uh, perhaps Bordeaux Whites might be might be something that's comparable. But at the end of the day, Sam, what I would always say is that we want our wines to be unique. We, we never want to make wines that are comparable with other regions. You know, we want to make wines that people go, how do we make those wines of Virginia and what does that mean? Um, but it's a, it's a really, really interesting question. You know, I think also when you make wine, you look at examples out there that, that really sort of give you the benchmark or style that you really want to make and for Viognier I always talk of the the Northern Rhone um, and I, I love sort of conjure you kind of Viognier's. Vidal is interesting because there's not a lot of Vidal made on a commercial scale elsewhere um, but I, I love sort of the the juxtaposition between the texture and the weight and the viscosity but I, I love that it's got acidity and brightness and vibrancy but uh, phenomenal question appreciate you being involved so uh, thank you so much for that, and, and God bless you and your family. Say hi to uh, hi to Ray. All right. I don't know if you want to wait till the end on this, but um, you had a question last week if you could talk about your history. Oh, um, there's a question about my my sort of journey to to Virginia. Um, yeah, look, uh, I I grew up in in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, I think, you know, as, as many kids, we were not 100% sure of what we want to do. You know, I, I studied classical music. Um, I studied a bunch of different things. And I, I got a job working at a winery. Um, and we're frozen, I think. Um, heavily frozen, actually. So I wonder if anyone can see me. So um, let me keep talking because I'm not sure. But I, sweetie, I think we're frozen. And, and anyway, so I grew up in Cape Town and I, I got a job at a winery called Hur Constantia. I started working there in 1995. So I've been in the wine industry for, for what, 25 years. And I've done pretty much every, every job in the, in the industry. You know, I've, I've worked in the vineyards, I've worked in the cellar, I've done hospitality, I, I've done sort of wholesale calls, probably not the accounting side of it. Um, I studied winemaking at a, a school called Alsenburg Agricultural College in, in Stellenbosch and um, I finished up working at a winery called Flagstone which was a phenomenal learning experience because um, Flagstone actually sourced vineyards from all over South Africa from Stellenbosch, Constantia, uh, from Oatswern, from Walker Bay which was cool and I wanted to travel I really I really wanted to go and make wine elsewhere and, and America was certainly on the list along with sort of Europe and, and Napa Valley was certainly and I was working through this incredible university called Ohio State or I, I lie it's the Ohio State University and um, instead of going to, to Napa Valley I had a chance to join Keswick Vineyards and um, I was chatting with Al and Cindy Schoenberg and what was so intriguing about Keswick and Virginia was that Keswick was a, a brand new winery. 2002 was the first vintage. 
I came across not as a winemaker, but as an intern. We, we had a winemaker or consultant winemaker. Um, I worked there for two years. I then left to go to Rappahannock Cellars in 2004 and 2005. And then I rejoined Keswick in 2006 as the winemaker and general manager. And then in 2012, I was the, uh, the winemaker and vineyard manager. And um, that's the story. I, I met my beautiful wife, uh, Kath, which is the 99.2% reason why I'm in, um, in Virginia. But I also, I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the opportunity. Um, and I fell in love with the potential of, um, of making wines. Um, if anyone's still watching, let me know. And my screen says, sorry, we're having yeah. trouble playing this video. Um, you know, so yeah, that's the story. It's, uh, it's a story that it's in its infancy. You know, we're, we're still working really hard. Uh, I think we've done some incredible things. Um, I have an incredible team. I have a, a vineyard that is phenomenal. But I think we've planted our best vineyards. I think our best wines are still to be made. There's still a lot to learn. You know, there's the business of wine in terms of trends and what people drink. There's the, the viticultural aspect, which in Virginia is really, really tough. How do you grow grapes consistently year to year despite the, the adverse weather conditions? Just take 2018 and 19 and 20. You couldn't, you couldn't really talk about three different vintages. So um, I always think that Virginia is an emerging wine region that we've made some phenomenal wines and that I think we've made some incredible waves in terms of quality within the world of wine but we've still got a lot more to do um, and that's the story Charlottesville is home I think there's always a part of me that that says I'm always South African it's where I was uh, raised and there's a, a part of me that 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 sort of has that there's a, a bit of Africa in me and my heart's always there but Charlottesville and America is is home and uh, yeah Excuse me, my apologies. That's the story. Um, like I said, we're in chapter one or two. You know, there's still a long novel to be written, and, and I hope that means some more world class wines to be made and better wines to be made. Um, but I, I love every minute of making wines in Virginia. I love raising a family and being in Charlottesville. Uh, I couldn't think of, a, of another region in the world to, to be right now. So that's the, that's the story in the nutshell. So, and uh, one, one comment is incredible family. Indeed, incredible family, incredibly blessed um, to have a wife and a, and a daughter who are, are phenomenal and um, to work where I do in this, this great country and world of ours. And yeah, I'm excited about what the next 20 years hold. And, and I hope you are too. I think, you know, just the upswing in quality of Keswick and Virginia wines in the last 10 years has been phenomenal. Um, but there's still a lot of more work to do. And, and you know, we're not going to rest on our laurels and we'll never make the perfect wine because we still think the perfect wine is still to be made. But that's the, that's the story in a heartbeat. Anything else? That's about it. Um, Susan Glenn asked, what would be the effect on the wine if you added more of the dog wine? Hmm. Um, the question is, uh, Susan uh, Glenn, uh, what, what would happen if you added more of the dog blanc? And the honest answer is I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, we, we haven't used Vidal in, in this sort of percentage um, at all. But knowing Vidal, Vidal can be really sort of rich, but it always has this sort of bitterness. If you, if you love beer and you love IPAs and you have that sort of bitterness there, the bitter units in beer, I find Vidal gives you that subtle sensorial character on the back end of the, of the palate as well. Um, so I think it would... It would change the organoleptic characteristics of Viognier. We might still get the aromatic, you know, um, characteristics of the Viognier, but I think on the palate, you get a little bit more bitterness, more sort of weight and, and textural kind of qualities. But I certainly think you might might sort of lose a little bit of the acidity and the freshness and the fruit from there as well. But I'm not a, I'm not 100% sure. We've never um, used a, a huge portion of the doll. So just purely experiential, I, I just don't know. But I really love what it does. Um, I really what I love what it does to to this Viognier. And let's talk about that, by the way. Um, uh, how can you get it? Because the 2019 is actually not available right now. We're still currently pouring the 2017. But because you're such incredible people, and um, you know we love you guys so much, we want to make sure you can get it today if you want. 
And I think it's a phenomenal little wine. And if you do enjoy it, let us know. Um, but three bottles or more, you get 15% uh, if you're in the, not in the wine club. I always say you really should be in the wine club, but there's some incredible benefits to, to do. But if you are in the wine club, you're going to get 30%. Um, whether you're a silver or gold member, if in the wine club, you're going to get 30%. And if you get six bottles or more, we're going to ship it to you for free. The other option is to um, buy six bottles or more and come pick it up. And have a glass of wine during the week and come say hi. We always love to see you folks. Um, the other question is, uh, 4th of July, are we open? Yes, we are. We, we are open. Uh, reservations are recommended. Uh, all the information is on our website. We have Tara Mills and her band uh, because it's always reds, whites and bluegrass, which is the music. Uh, the wine is going to be cold. We've got our staff ready to welcome you. Everything is socially distanced. We've done um, an incredible amount of work to make sure that you, the customer and our staff are, are safe and sound. But for all that details, visit uh, keswickvineyards.com. But 4th of July, uh, 11 to 5. Uh, I'm not sure on all the details, but 12 to, 4 is, 12 to 4 is the music, my wife is saying. But come and spend the day with us. You know, reserve a table, come join us. The weather's supposed to be beautiful. The wine's going to be cold. The music's going to be great. There are going to be lots of people. And let's uh, let's celebrate um, just being outdoors in this wonderful country of ours. So, um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Kevin Norfleet says, did you make a 2019 Vidal Blanc? And we did not. Um, we have in the past, Kevin, to be honest, and we, we purchased fruit from our dear friends at Williamsburg Winery from Matthew Mayer. And, um, you know, we decided not to. We had a, a bumper crop. There was no need to. We, we made Chardonnay, Viognier, uh, two Chardonnays. We're actually bottling the next Chardonnay uh, July 30th, 31st. We're bottling a second Rosé. Uh, we've got Chardonnay, two Chards, two Vios, um, the Trevilian White. And, uh, yeah, so no, no Vidal. No Vidal. I would imagine that moving forward, the Vidal is just going to be a part of the blend, to be honest. I, I love the Trevilian. I love the label. I think we can tweak it a little bit. Um, I think it's a phenomenal little wine. You know, it's a great summertime wine. It's uh, it's still going to develop some, and, and I hope you enjoy it. But yeah, no, no, 2019 Vidal Blanc. So um, uh, let's see what else there is. Um, yeah, um, let's let's always send up with a with a thought for the day before we sort of finish up. Again, you know, want to make sure that that everyone's doing well, and again, we also want to make sure that we thank you. Thank you for being a part of this, whatever this is, this chat, this show, this little kind of reunion. Um, we, we kind of really enjoy and appreciate the fact that you spend some time with us and drink our wine and support us. And for that, we are internally grateful. And, and that, uh, that detail is not missed. So we are our family, my family, our extended family, our staff. We're all very, very grateful to you. The other thing is, you know, Again, every every week we, we read about all the rubbish in the world, you know, the politics and the divisiveness and the divisions amongst us. You know, come on, let's let's just uh, recognize that we're all people and that people are inherently good and that we have a lot to offer. But it always starts with us, right? So, you know, go out there, you know, smile, be happy, stay positive, tell people you love them, be kind. Oh, my God, kindness costs you nothing and it means the world. So, um, you know... That's the message, you know, we, we can all practice a little bit more kindness. Uh, there's always some good wine in the future. And again, you know, support Virginia, you know, drink Virginia. Virginia makes incredible wines. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be Keswick. We, we love that it's, it is Keswick, um, but, but support local, drink local, be proud of the, the wines that we, we have over here. So yeah, 2019 Trevilian, um, under screw cap, beautiful little wine, it's been in the bottle. Uh, for about a, a month. I think it's tasting wonderfully well right now considering that it's been in the bottle for such a short amount of time. Um, have fun with wine, drink wine, try different things, play around with, uh, with food. I'm seeing some happy birthday messages. Thank you so much. It is my 44th tomorrow. Um, you know, it's a, it's a day that I don't have off. Thank you, Alan, Cindy. But, um, you know, thank you for all the, uh, all the wishes. I, I appreciate it. God bless you guys. If I haven't mentioned you or said hi, um, you know that every one of you, we appreciate it. Um, again, just, uh, just to go through it, the Trevelyan Red, the 19, what's on the website and what we're currently selling is the 17, but the 19 is the Viognier Vidal. 
30% off as a wine club member, 15% if you're not. Free shipping is on six bottles or more, or you can order it and you can come pick it up. The other question is, um, you know, people are asking about our barrel program, uh, just to, to not kind of delve off subject, but our barrel program is a, is a phenomenal club to join. It's your barrel, um, you buy it, you just allow us to keep it and use it for sort of five, six, seven years, and in return, we're gonna give you a case of wine, we're gonna put the wine in the barrel that you want, you can come taste wines out of your barrel, you get the same discounts of dis uh, you get the same discounts as wine club members, um, and at the end of the day, we're going to give you the barrel. You know, take the barrel home with you, do what you want with it. So, if you're interested in the in the barrel club, again on our website, talk to other barrel members. It's a great way to to be a bit more flexible, to to kind of pick and choose, and obviously from an educational point of view, to come and taste wines out of your barrel as they age and mature. So, let me tell you this before I go, um, Bill May. Oh my God, Bill. It is so wonderful to see you. I, I would imagine you're still on the uh, on the West Coast. We miss you, but I hope you and your family are doing well. Um, again, you know, give you three reasons why you should join the wine club. Um, the wines are awesome. The people that are there are going to treat you like gold, and I promise you the wines are going to get better. So if you're a wine lover, um, you know, the best wines are still to be made, and if you've had our wines before, you've know we've made some decent ones. So I'm excited about the future. So... Um, yeah, uh, let's see, there's, oh, it's my wife. Yes, we plan to continue tasting Tuesdays in July, still working on the details. Um, not sure what the details are yet, sweetheart, but yeah, look, we, we love doing it. So if you if you enjoy this time, I know people are going back to work and going back to normal. If you don't mind spending some time with me gabbering and gibbering about wine, let us know. Share it with your friends. Tell us what you want us to talk about. Is it wine? Is it wine in general? Is it theory? Is it just drinking let us know. We, we want to make sure that you get value for this. It's not always about sales. It's about learning. It's about spending time together. And, and I enjoy them. So if, you, if you'll have me, we'll continue doing this. Absolutely. So um, just a pretty one. You know, it's, uh, it's been six days and 23 hours since we've seen each other. And it's, uh, it's going to be six days and 23 hours since we see you again. Next week, by the way, is the Trevilian Red Wine. The Trevilian Red is a Cabernet Petit Verdot blend, it's phenomenal. Um, for those that want to know, you want to decant it, probably about two hours prior to prior to, to, to kind of drinking it. Uh, you want to pour it in a glass that actually is quite big, that's quite an aerated glass. And I would serve that at, at sort of room temperature with maybe a slight chill on it. We're gonna talk about the Trevelyan Red, how we made it. And then um, we'll have some announcements about what we're gonna do in July. I think we've got some really cool ideas about uh, about what we're gonna do. We wanna make sure that you know, we inspire you and we, we get you excited about what's coming out. So I can tell you this, um, I did a, a quick taste about 2017 Block 7 Cabernet that is um, now going on its 33rd month in barrel. And I think, and I'll say it right here, that this is the best Cabernet that we've ever, ever made. Uh, July 30th, by the way, uh, we're bottling some more wine, Chardonnay Reserve. The, uh, the Rosé Reserve, the Petit Vido, the Merlot, and the Cab Franc. So those are coming in your wine club shipment soon. After that, we have the, uh, the sort of the higher end, the block designated Cab Francs, the 17 Heritage, the 17 Cab Sav, a beautiful dessert wine made from Petit Mansang. So there's are a lot of reasons to stay in this club. There's incredible wines coming your way. Any questions, let us know. Anything you don't understand, uh, you want to find out, reach out to our tasting room, 244-3341, extension 105, on our website, check out our Facebook page, reach out to me if there's anything else. But, um, you know, God bless all of you. You know, God bless you and your families. Uh, stay safe, stay kind, be well. I'm looking forward to, to next week. Uh, there's a question from, um, I think it's Terry, T-shirts, are we doing any more, Cap? Um, we don't know, but we will get back to you. So uh, Chris Schoenberg, uh, Cass sister, my sister-in-law designed the t-shirts. We will reach out to her. We will ask if we can do more um, t-shirts. If we will, we will link it up on the Facebook page. Um, we want to make sure that you can you can get these beautiful, beautiful t-shirts. They're, they're soft, they're comfortable, tasting Tuesdays. Um, Janice Bryant asked the barrel tasting. That is one of the ideas that we are working on want to make sure that we can do it legally and the logistics of it as well. Um, Chris Schoenberg is here. Um, hello, Chris. So let us know if there's a few people that want to order more t-shirts. Are you able to, to do it? 
And if you can, if you can provide the link, Custom Inc., um, you know, if you don't mind jumping on there, Chris, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, Kevin says, how many cases do I have to pick up? Kevin, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm probably thinking it's probably more than three or four. Chris got back and says, absolutely, she can do more. So uh, if you if you want t-shirts, uh, Chris Schoenberg, she's on there. Let her know that you're interested. It's uh, incredible colors, incredible t-shirts, and she'll hook you up. So it's eight o'clock, and just like that, one hour is gone. Um, so ag again, you know, uh, life's too short to drink bad wine. You know, so drink Virginia. You know, that should be on a t-shirt, I guess. But Trevelyan White, it's a pretty little wine. It's a blend under a screw cap. I think over, -de uh, over delivers in, in quality, um, great value for money, and a, a beautiful wine. Hopefully, I explained the, the history behind it and the, and the name itself. Um, but until next Tuesday, we're, we're talking again about the, the Trevelyan Red. So have a wonderful day. Uh, happy Father's Day to all you dads out there and to all you moms. We know you're the rock stars and you're the most important people in the world. So appreciate you guys too. Um, thank you so much for, for, for your support and for, for being a part of our wine club and our family. And again, I think I'm, I'm just talking a little bit too much. So um, I would just say to thank you and I, I look forward to next week. And if I didn't get any uh, all of your questions, I will get on there tomorrow morning and respond to them. So have a wonderful day. Be safe. Be kind. I'll see you next week, Tuesday. Share it with your friends. Tell them that we have this little thing going on. And I'm excited about sharing the Trevelyan red wine with you. So until then, God bless. Good night. And have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead.